Hey look, I'm back in the anatomy lab. Tonight is the medical school's awards dinner or something like that, uh, which I am going to, so I did think about um, doing this in a tuxedo, but that would get a bit weird, right? Um, but it means that I think all the students are preparing for the awards dinner as well, and essentially what is the Christmas ball. So I've got the lab to myself this evening, even though there's an exam coming up soon, which I'm sure I shouldn't be worried about. They'll be fine, they know what they're doing, right? Yeah, okay, anyway, what it means is I've got the lab, so I've got all my models to hand, and today's topic, which I thought I'd talk about, is faecal continence. Because you probably take your faecal continence for granted, but you'll miss it when it's gone. And we'll be looking at the anatomy of the small intestine and the large intestine, so the obvious place to end is the anal canal. So there is a lot of really neat anatomy in the anal canal. It's surprising. And there are four mechanisms that work together to maintain faecal continence. That is, to keep the contents of your bowel inside your bowel until you're ready to void it from your bowel. And don't forget, it doesn't have to just be stool tight and kind of, you know, sometimes wet stool tight. It also has to be gas tight, and that is a challenge. This last bit here is the region we're talking about. So we saw we had the small bowel, and then the large bowel, and the sigmoid part, the sigmoid colon here, and then the rectum is the last part of the large intestine, the straight part of the large intestine, hence the word rectum, and then, I don't know why, but models always show the rectum open to the world, right? Whereas in, hopefully, in you and I, most of the time, <laughs> this opening to the large bowel is kept closed by <laughs> look at all these models. And I think they're all shown as open, which is a bit of a worry. But normally, this point here would be closed. So there's an anal canal and a whole bunch of muscles and bits and bobs in there that are closed. Now, we looked at the uh, smooth muscle of the large intestine and we said there was a circular layer um, closest to the lumen and then a longitudinal layer along the large intestine which we see here with these longitudinal bands. So remember those, that, those um, circular uh, smooth muscle layer of the large intestine because we're going to use that when we make an anal canal and we see these other blocks of muscle here. But the first thing is that while the rectum is in the pelvis that's the end of the rectum there. This is a female pelvis, so there's a vagina, urethra, and uh, anal opening here, which means on this side we can see the urethra, vagina, and the, the rectum there. Look, the rectum, it passes through the pelvic floor. So we've talked about the pelvic floor before, and the pelvic floor is kind of a hammock of muscles supporting not only the contents of the pelvis, that's the ob obvious bit, but it's also supporting everything else. So it's above the pelvis, right? Because you're a big tower of stuff. So it stops that big tower of stuff from falling out of your pelvis. So your pelvic floor is pretty important and you need to keep yours nice and firm and strong. And as you get to my age and older, that becomes more and more of a problem. Um, but the rectum passes through levator ani. So by doing that, it's leaving the pelvis, right? And so what we're kind of seeing in here, around this region there, all this muscle is surrounding what is the anal canal. So that means that actually the anal canal is within the perineum. So we're outside the pelvis, we're in this, uh, the perineal space is here. So perineum has a couple of meanings. Perineum means the skin, say in this case, between uh, the vaginal orifice and the anal orifice. That's, that region there would be the perineum. But also this space around here would be the perineum. We've got various perineal pouches and we break it up and we find various structures in there, right? Anyway, my point is, the anal canal is in the perineum rather than in the pelvis. The rectum's in the pelvis. But because the anal canal passes through the uh, levator ani, this leads us to our first of the four mechanisms of faecal continence. Now, do you remember? So, levator ani is made up of three muscles, and the most medial muscle is puborectalis. Sensibly named because it runs from the pubis, this is the pubis bone here, so it runs from the pubis to the rectum and around the rectum and back again. And in fact, can you see, look, here's the rectum, the posterior to that is, is the coccyx, where right? the bones of the coccyx are, are here. So in fact, there's this midline raphe where the two, the left and right puborectalis muscles meet and join together and that sort of thing. Right, so puborectalis is most medial and it, it loops around from the pubis bone around the rectum. Now when it does that, 
another female pelvis, that's a good idea, keep it simple. Let's have a look at this model. Yeah, look, see, <laughs> see that model's got an open anal canal as well. Why? Um, to show it's an opening, I suppose. <laughs> anyway, so I said the rectum was called rectum because it's straight. Now, for defecation to occur, so if the rectum has filled with feces and it needs to be evacuated, you do indeed need, need to straighten this out so the feces can be passed through it. But you can see here on this model, there's a kink in the rectum and the anal canal, right? It's brought forward, it's brought anteriorly. And what's doing that is the puborectalis muscles. Look, here's the pubis bone here. So puborectalis is coming around these guys here laterally. And because it's the, there's some tone in puborectalis, it's pulling the anal canal and the rectum anteriorly. So it's putting this kink into it. It's like putting a kink in your garden hose pipe, right? The water doesn't come out because it's got a kink in it. So it's quite a good mechanism of, of stopping flow. So that means for defecation to occur, puborectalis needs to relax, so it lengthens, and then all of this straightens out. So you, you straighten out your kink in your garden hose pipe and the water flows again, or in this case, the feces can, can leave the rectum. That means that you need to, of course, um, the levator ani muscle group, the pelvic floor, is under somatic innervation, right? I'm, I'm squeezing my pelvic floor now in what might be called a, a Kegel exercise, right? So you can maintain the tone and maintain the strength of your pelvic floor muscles by, by contracting them. So they're under somatic control. So that means puborectalis is under somatic control. So you have control over that, right? You can choose not to defecate if you feel the urge to defecate by pulling on your puborectalis muscle and another muscle which we'll mention in a moment. So it's important to keep puborectalis strong for normal faecal continence and it's important to keep puborectalis strong in case you need to hold on to it. Now look, in here you can see these two layers here. So this is that, this is that continuation of the smooth muscle layer of the large bowel here lining the lumen of the anal canal, but we've got this extra muscle here, outside of that. These are two other muscles we use in faecal continence. So let's do number two. Number two, do number two. The second structure involved in maintaining faecal continence would be the internal anal sphincter. So the internal anal sphincter then is that, that circular layer of smooth muscle that's lining the large bowel, continues into the, the anal canal, and it thickens around here, right? So this is smooth muscle. The smooth muscle has become a sphincter, and that's the internal anal sphincter because it's internal. Because it's smooth muscle, it's not under somatic control. This is under control of the autonomic nervous system. That means that sympathetic innervation causes the internal anal sphincter to contract and have tone, and then parasympathetic innervation causes it to relax, so it allows defecation to occur. Now the external anal sphincter, outside that, is somatic muscle. And the external anal sphincter is innervated by branches of the pudendal nerve. And the pudendal nerve is, it's, it's, it's your famous nerve that's involved in all the sensory stuff around here. So it's the main nerve, the main sensory nerve to the external genitalia and stuff like that. So it's an, a pretty important nerve in this region. And it's also involved in faecal continence. So that gives you somatic control over the external anal sphincter. So like puborectalis, you can also clench your external anal sphincter to keep the anal canal closed if you need to keep it closed and the mechanisms in here are trying to open it. Um, so that's number three. The external anal sphincter is the third mechanism of faecal continence. We can also see that on the bit that I took off this model, right? You can see, look, there's that ring. So this is the external anal sphincter and it's running from the anocoxygeal ligament to the uh, perineal body, right? These are a couple of good attachment sites around here. Now look, you can just about see here how the external um, anal sphincter is kind of like inferior most. So the external anal sphincter is, is surrounding the inferior part of the anal canal, whereas the internal anal sphincter is more significant on the upper part of the anal canal. So they kind of overlap a little bit, but there's also some separation there. Now, while we're talking about innovation, 
There's some cool stuff going on here and it relates back to the embryology. Right, so we've spoken a little bit before about foregut, midgut and hindgut. So the hindgut is the embryological last part of the early gut tube and it's formed like part of the large intestine and so on. And now the hindgut is the last part of the gut tube and it's derived from endoderm or at least the epithelial lining is derived from endoderm and then it's meeting the ectoderm the outer embryonic cell layer so this the cell layer that's going to form the epidermis of the skin now these layers kind of relate to the other structures that form around them so we see the internal anal sphincter is uppermost and it's part of the hindgut and it's from smooth muscle and it has autonomic innovation like the rest of the, the GI tract. But we see that the external anal sphincter is more like, um, it's a somatic muscle. So it, it's, it's, it attaches to the skin. It's more of a, an, out, an, externally, a, an external type of tissue, right? So that's kind of more aligned with the ectoderm. So we have the endoderm tube meeting the ectoderm from outside the embryo. And we have this overlap of of uh, endoderm and ectoderm derived tissues and one example of that is seeing the um, the autonomic innovation innovating the internal anal sphincter and the somatic innovation the pudendal nerve innovating the external anal sphincter what this means is that in the anal canal the external part of the anal canal has innovation like the skin does which means that here this part, the inferior part of the anal canal, is very sensitive to pain, to temperature, to fine touch, all of those sorts of things, which you might be aware of, right? But, as you go up and you go up above this, this pectinate line here, which kind of shows the boundary between the, the hindgut and the ectoderm, as you go up the anal canal, so the upper part of the anal canal does not have that same somatic innovation, so it is not sensitive to pain, temperature, fine touch. It's more like the GI tract, so it's sensitive to stretch. It's full of stretch receptors, so when the rectum fills and becomes stretched, that's when you get the signals that you need to void your rectum, right? You need to defecate. So the, the, the innovation of the lower part, the inferior part of the anal canal, is different to the innovation of the upper part of the anal canal um, in terms of sensory stuff. Isn't that interesting? Who knew there was so much anatomy going on in the anal canal? This also means there's an overlap of blood vessels. The liver. I know, it's a long way away from the anal canal, but it's not really. Now, the liver, um, all of the blood from the GI tract passes to the liver because the GI tract is absorbing lots of good stuff from the stuff what you eat. Um, the nutrients get absorbed across the cell membranes, get passed into the blood, and then all that blood eventually gets to the portal vein and goes to the liver, and one of the liver's 500 different jobs is to process all of that stuff, or rather that's like about 400 out of its 500 jobs, is processing that stuff, and then off it goes around the body or gets stored or what have you, right? So a huge amount of blood passes through the liver, and the liver surrounds the inferior vena cava, and that blood goes back to the heart. So we talk about the portal circulation, the blood flowing from the GI tract to the liver. And then we talk about the systemic circulation, so blood flowing around the rest of the body, which we're aware of. And then we talk about portosystemic anastomoses, areas in the body where the portal circulation overlaps with the systemic circulation, and there are anastomoses there, and there are five of them. I'm gonna talk about one of them, and you might have guessed that's in the anal canal, because that's our topic for today, right? Now, um, normally, lots of blood flows through the, river, li through the liver, and everything's hunky-dory, but sometimes the liver gets damaged. The liver's pretty good at repairing itself, but over time, if it keeps having to repair itself, um, it becomes full of fibrous material, and this is when we see cirrhosis of the liver. And when the liver becomes cirrhotic, when it becomes full of fibrous material, it gets very hard to push all of that blood through the liver and back to the inferior vena cava. But with the competing pressures in the body, that blood has to get back to the systemic circulation somehow. Now, in the anal canal, we see an overlap between the ectoderm 
and the endoderm, speaking embryologically. Now, the GI tract down here drains its blood through the inferior mesenteric vein, which comes up and joins with the splenic vein and superior mesenteric vein, and goes to the portal vein and goes to the liver, right? So the blood from here flows up here and up to the liver, through the liver and to the inferior vena cava, and back into the systemic circulation and around the body. Now, the blood from the lower part of the anal canal, so the inferior part, that's as we've seen, we've seen the pudendal nerve already involved there, we've seen those ectoderm derived things there. The blood from there drains back to the blood vessels of the pelvis, so the internal iliac vein, then the common iliac vein, and then the inferior vena cava and back off around the body. All right? Now, if the blood is struggling to get through the liver and back to the inferior vena cava through that direction, you might see a change in direction of blood flow. The blood, because it can't go that way, may go down the inferior mesenteric vein and across a bunch of anastomoses to the veins that are going to drain to the internal iliac vein. So we've got superior rectal veins, middle rectal veins, and inferior rectal veins, right? And uh, we see those veins overlapping with one another, connecting with one another, anastomosing with one another, and normally the flow is in the normal direction and it's no biggie. But in this case, if the blood can't flow that way, it flows this way and it flows across those anastomosing veins and into, into the internal iliac vein. Um, which might sound like a good solution, but veins are not muscular blood vessels. They're thin-walled blood vessels, which means that when you start passing more blood than usual across them, then they will dilate and you may get varices and they may bleed and so on. So if you see enlarged veins in the anal canal, what are we talking about there? Hemorrhoids or piles. So hemorrhoids or piles are not an indication of liver disease, but liver disease may cause hemorrhoids or piles. Right? There are other things that cause hemorrhoids or piles. Um, so that is one of the port of systemic anastomosis. The other one's in the lower um, esophagus. We also see um, caput medusae around the umbilicus, and there are a couple of others hidden away. But that's, that's the one for today. Now, the next question then, this leads us into why do we have all these blood vessels lining the anal canal? Oh, I'm glad you asked. You've got... So far, you've got three muscles. You've got your internal anal sphincter, you've got your external anal sphincter. That sounds pretty good so far, right? You've got your puborectalis, putting a kink in the tube. Um, so you've got, you've got your tube, right? And um, you're going to use those sphincters to close off your anal canal. Um, but you know what happens when you take a tube, right? And you try and just squeeze it shut. There's little, there's little holes in there. Right, and I'm sure that looks pretty familiar, but look, there's gaps in that. All right, that isn't a good seal. Are you going to trust that? Because you're not just trying to stop, you know. Best case scenario, you've got nice, big, firm stools that you're going to try and stop coming out, and that's not going to go out through that little hole, great. But sometimes these stools aren't nice, great, big, firm stools, right? Have a look at the Bristol stool chart, and you'll see the stools come in a variety of, um, densities and liquidosities and I think I've just made that word up um, and also don't forget it's not just going to be stool tight and maybe liquidy stool tight it's got to be airtight right because we have a number of bacteria in our large intestine that tend to make a bit of gas and sometimes in polite company we prefer to keep that gas within we've got our three mechanisms our three muscles but we need something else to make a, a proper airtight seal to our colon so the anal canal is lined by a number of blood vessels and we can, we can, you know, we can kind of maybe imagine these blood vessels sticking out, right? So, so think of the, so instead of having just a nice round tube, you've got blood vessels bulging through the mucosa, through the surface, right? And think of it like a, a number of long balloons, like what I've got here, some, right, here's some, uh, some packing material. There's a number of inflated thingies here, right? Now look, if you get your, and these are called the vascular anal cushions, right? So these blood vessels in the anal canal are called vascular anal cushions. Now if you get your vascular anal cushions and they've got a bit of pressure in them because they've got blood in them, and you push those together, oh yeah, that's a beautiful tight seal. You'd trust that. So you've got your gap there, 
you give these vascular anal cushions a squeeze and look at that that is a solid airtight watertight that's that's properly closed off isn't it so that's your fourth structure involved in fecal continence right that's number four so we've got our um puborectalis muscle internal anal sphincter external anal sphincter and the vascular anal cushions all work together and they give you a perfect seal at the end of your GI tract, keeping everything in. So then everything needs to relax and straighten out for defecation to occur. Isn't that a clever mechanism? Um, this means that for fecal continence to work perfectly, you kind of need all four of those things to function normally. And if you think about um, this being a mucosa, um, if if the, uh, the mucosa of the anal canal gets damaged, so if there's a tumour there disrupting the shape, or if there's scar tissue, maybe from surgery or from injury, um, or if there's an abscess or something like that, something affecting the shape of the anal canal so you can't make this seal, then it's likely that faecal incontinence will occur. So if somebody has faecal incontinence, you need to think of the, the muscular uh, the possibility of you know muscular problems causing the faecal incontinence but also this structure and these structures of the anal canal may also if they're disrupted lead to faecal incontinence all right so go and have a <laughs> it is that way. go and have a look at that uh pelvic floor video again um to talk about um how important that is to um continence and general and good things like that. Okay then, so that's most of the anatomy of the anal canal. While we're here, would you like to have a look at the ischioanal fossa, also known as the ischiorectal fossa? Just quickly, just so you know what that term means, right? Of course you would. <laughs> right, so if we're looking at the pelvis, this is the ischium, so pubis, ischium, ilium, this is the ischium, and then this is the anal canal, and the rectum's in there as well. And you see this gap here, this space? So this is the ischioanal fossa, this space here. Now if you imagine that covered with skin, um, this space here is largely filled with fat, it's got a few nerves and blood vessels and what have you running through it, and it's very handy because, it, because it's just a space filled with fat, it means that during defecation, the anal canal and the rectum can expand into it, right? They can just push, up, push on this fat and the rectum can open and you can defecate quite easily. But a, um, a potential clinical problem here is that if um, an infection ends up in here, through whatever means, then the ischioanal fossa can fill with that infection. You might get a big abscess in there. And that'll change the way this feels here. Patients might um, complain of a sense of fullness, of tenderness if you poke this region around here. And um, there's a problem that that abscess might burst. So it might burst externally into the skin, which you would see, but it could also burst internally into the anal canal, right? Which would be not good for all the reasons we've talked about before with faecal continence. So that's the ischioanal fossa. So if so people talk about the ischioanal fossa, that's all it is. It's just this space here between the ischium and the anal canal. Okay, there you go. So we've looked at the four structures involved in normal faecal continence. If you come across faecal incontinence, remember all four of them. Don't just think about muscle weakness, but worry about the shape of the anal canal. Has that been affected? So I'm off to the Medical School Awards dinner, gonna have a few beers, go to bed early, get up for a long run in the morning. <laughs> Should be a good fun with the anatomy group, we've got a table together. Um, I can imagine this tie's gonna stay on for long, usually ties are for funerals and uh, exam days, and that's about it. But um, right, I'll see you guys next week.